every year, Britain gets caught in the cold. Snow comes almost as predictably as bank holidays. It falls for some 15 days in the home counties, 25 days in the Pennines, and 30 days in Scotland. Yet we never seem ready for it. Even a mild winter brings trouble. A severe one, chaos. Cities crawl to a standstill. Trafalgar Square is never so dead. And England expects every milkman to do his duty on his Ice Age round. For those in the country, it means a life under siege in a Christmas card setting that's fine for Eskimos, but hardly for mid-20th century Britons. The nation counts the cost in millions. Millions of pounds, millions of man-hours lost by those unable to get to work. And as if traffic wardens and parking meters aren't enough, there are new burdens for the poor motorist to shoulder. It's an age of scientific miracles and progress, yet Britain still slips and skids into a state of winter paralysis. For the airlines, snow and ice can be a costly business. Cost, that's the problem. Cost and the need for bold ideas. Here at London Airport, men work round the clock to keep the four and a half miles of runways open. But the cost of heating them would be enormous. It's the same on the railways, where some 1,400 points are heated and 100,000 are not. To heat them all would cost around 20 million pounds. So it's back to elbow grease to clear the packed snow and ice. On the southern region, they have 13 ghost trains like this loaded with antifreeze for spraying on the conductor rails of electric lines and running through the night while tomorrow's passengers are fast asleep. They can also scrape the rails clear of ice. Less affected by snow and ice are trains powered from overhead cables, like this one on the eastern region. But the system's expensive, and some say, an eyesore. On the roads, the battle against snow and ice is a major operation. Along the M1 here, they found the best ammunition against ice is salt. On most stretches of Britain's 200,000 miles of roads, though, it's man and machine versus snow, a bleak front line where words have lost their meaning. In the towns, the snow clearance bills run into thousands of pounds a week as armies of casuals are recruited. There goes another threepence on the rates. But some roads are self-clearing, such as two of London's modern developments, the Hyde Park underpass and the Hammersmith flyover. They're fitted with a system of surface heating that switches on automatically when the road temperature falls to near freezing. And here's one way of keeping sport alive on frozen Saturday afternoons. The playing pitch is warmed by electric wires ploughed into the soil six inches under the surface. When the temperature falls to near freezing, the warm-up begins. This way, a five-inch covering of snow was cleared from a football pitch in two nights. Just wait till somebody suggests warming things up for the crowds on the popular side terracing, though. Here at the Road Research Laboratory near London, they're working out many a new idea for beating the snow and ice. With this backroom test bed, they're developing more effective snow ploughing methods and equipment. He's measuring the amount of snow pushed aside by the blade at different angles. In this wind tunnel, scientists set up toy blizzards using chemicals for snow to check a simple brainwave. Set up special fences some 20 yards from the road, somebody thought, and they might check drifts and deflect the wind-blown snow over the road. They did, and now real fences have gone up alongside roads in Derbyshire, Scotland, the West Riding and South Wales. In position two is the Ministry of Transport's heavy armour, 
the snow plows and gritters, the snow blowers and salt spreaders from depots strategically placed across the country for just such an emergency as this. Over the country as a whole, there are some 12,000 vehicles for snow clearing, but many need modernizing, unlike this snow blower, which can slice an eight foot wide path through a 12 foot drift. But how much can we afford to spend on more equipment like this? In the exposed countryside, horsepower gives way to horses for rescue work that's kept these farmers at full stretch for 18 to 20 hours a day. Thousands of sheep lie buried and some of those still alive are sick with snow fever. Somehow, they've got to be brought to the sanctuary of the farm or the safety of easier ground. For man and horse, it's a supreme test. And when this cavalry of mercy can't reach flocks stranded high on the Exmoor Plateau, where the drifts run deep, the helicopter comes into its own, in an unforeseen role for the RAF. Squadrons operate from dawn to dusk to save marooned cattle and sheep. It's a race against the clock and the weather, and this farmer's in a hurry to help them land safely to pick up animal fodder. Smoke is made to give the pilot directions. Conditions are dicey. Ice forms on the rotor blade. Visibility's poor in the freezing fog, but it's clear this time, and they're in. Fodder goes aboard, tons of it, airlifted from farms in the hard-hit West Country. Now to find the animals. Farmer and pilot plan the dropping zone. In a severe winter, the toll of animals is enormous. The deer down there will have to do as best they can this time. This mission's to save farm stock. And there they are, scared of the helicopter, but soon they'll come back to feed. For some animals, the food comes too late. They've been frozen to death. But others around here are alive, and among the isolated cattle is found this one-day-old calf, nearly dead, but soon to be revived. There are other snow babies too, including these lambs that were born in the blizzard. Rescue has come none too soon. When the emergency rations come up, you've got to be one of the family, or there's none for you. It's a hard life, and mum's only worried about her own lambs. In a severe winter, what you lose on the swings, you don't gain on the roundabouts. But the enthusiasm of these youngsters could be an object lesson to some local authorities whose job is to ensure that we're not always caught out when it's cold. 